Hi everyone, this is Nuclear Pep Talk and I'm Ksenia Bernavska, your local guide into the nuclear world. And... Hi. Hi everyone, this is Nuclear Pep Talk and I'm Ksenia Bernavska, your local guide into the nuclear world. Nuclear Pep Talk is a platform where we try to debunk myths and fears about everything nuclear, hopefully in simple terms and with remarkable experts. In this episode, we're continuing the Nuclear Legacy series and we're going to talk to the Benedict Cabo Medicine, who is the executive director of the Marshallese Educational Initiative. And he is also coming from a family that has been directly affected by the nuclear testing program on the Marshall Islands conducted by the United States. Benedict is going to walk us through the nuclear testing program on the Marshall Islands and he will also tell us about the numerous humanitarian consequences of nuclear testing that Marshallese people are still suffering from. Benedict will also kindly share with us what can be done and what we can do to help Marshallese to overcome their daily challenges that stem from the long ago halted nuclear testing program. I hope you enjoy this episode. See you there. So, hey, Benedict, thank you very much for agreeing to be on the podcast today. And without further ado, my question to you, can you tell us where are the Marshall Islands for those people who don't, who know nothing about them? Well, Senya, thank you, uh, first of all, for the invitation to be part of your show. Um, so the Marshall Islands, for those who have never heard of the Marshall Islands or don't know where they are, uh, they're located halfway between Hawaii and Australia. Um, so right, I would say about southeast of Guam. Okay. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And sorry for maybe a little bit of a stupid question, but I know that a lot of people are not very good in geography. So we have to, you know, clarify that for the first, um, with the first question. Okay. And can you tell us what happened in Marshall Islands? Um, the United States conducted 67 large-scale nuclear weapons, which is equivalent to 7,200 Hiroshima bombs. Um, prior to testing nuclear weapons, the United States was looking for a place where they could develop nuclear weapons. Um, and so of all the places, they chose the Marshall Islands because of its geographic location uh, because of the small indigenous population uh, and because it was far away from the American public. And how, how did it happen that the United States could actually test their nuclear weapons at the territory of Marshall Islands? The Marshall Islands was under the control of the United States uh, through the U.S. Navy at the time. And because the Marshall Islands was already under the United States, it made it easier for the U.S. to um, consider the Marshall Islands as a place where they could test nuclear weapons. And what had happened was they approached a community on uh, Bikini Atoll, which is uh, one of the two places in the Marshall Islands that was used for nuclear testing. And so they approached the Bikinian community um, and basically asked them if they could use their homelands for nuclear testing. Uh, this was uh, February 1946. Now, a few weeks prior to asking the Bikinians, President Truman had actually made the decision uh, that the Bikini Atoll, Bikini Atoll would be the place uh, for the United States to test nuclear weapons. And so really, this was a, a, a way to try to downplay the fact that the Bikinians were actually being forcefully removed. And so by making it seem like they were getting permission from the Bikinians, um, the reality was the decision was already made and therefore, you know, they were gonna test these nuclear weapons. And that's truly horrible. But did Bikini, did people in the Bikini Atoll actually say yes to that? And if so, why did they decide to agree to that? Well, at the time, Marshallese did not know what nuclear weapons were, nor mm -hmm. their capabilities. Um, and the U.S. was using religion. They were using God and the Bible as a means to convince the locals that, you know, they were wanting to do these testing because uh, 
God chose them to, and because it was good for for mankind. That pretty much, uh, you know, made it easier for for them to to give give their lands to to the United States. But the actuality is, they were forcefully removed. Can you tell what kind of damage was caused uh, to Marshallese? Well, forced relocation was definitely um, the first thing that people experience. Um, you know, having to live on your homelands where your people have called home for thousands of years and being removed all of a sudden um, really change the, you know, the way of life for people. People began seeing environmental problems um, and shortly after that, health problems. Uh, take, for instance, March 1st, 1954, when the United States detonated their largest and most powerful uh, device called Castle Bravo. This device was a, a thousand times uh, more powerful than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And fallout from Castle Bravo affected communities nearby as well as across the Marshall Islands. And so people on uh, Rongola Batol, for, for example, um, thought the fallout was snow. And so children were playing in it. They actually ate it. Um, people had skin burns. Hairs were falling out. Uh, women, a few years down the road, began giving birth to jellyfish babies or babies with no eyes, no bones. Um, and then, of course, numerous types of cancers. Look can you say how you connected to Marshallese people? First and foremost, I am a Marshallese. Um, mm -hmm. I was born in the Marshall Islands. Um, and I'm also a Bikinian. Uh, my dad's side of the family, his mother, she was actually the last one in our family to be on Bikini Atoll, to live on Bikini Atoll. Um, she was actually uh, one of the original 167 Bikinians who were removed from Bikini uh, on March 7th of 1946. And she has not been back to Bikini at all. And she's almost 80 years old now. Is there a chance that she can be back home at some point in the future? Well, right now, you know, Bikini is still unsafe for human habitation. Um, you're talking about uh, high levels of radiation, uh, nuclear waste, and people really cannot depend on food that's grown on the land um, mm -hmm. because it's not healthy, it's not safe for them. Were there any kind of compensation to people because of these issues? And if, if there was, but was it you know, fully covering the damage that actually had been caused? Only $150 million was provided in compensation through the Compact of Free Association under Section 177. Um, and so really, that is not enough to deal with these environmental and health problems that people are still dealing with to this day. What is the compact and how, you know, how the compact appeared in the whole story? Mm -hmm. Well, I personally think that the compact is um, what I like to call an imperialist policy. This uh, treaty, was signed in 1986, and that's when the United States uh, began recognizing us as an independent nation. Um, and this compact, it allows Marshallese to come here to the United States for employment, education, health, and other reasons. Despite the fact that the compact stems from the nuclear legacy, yet it does not address the nuclear legacy. Um, and so we have to renegotiate a new compact every, uh, I believe, every 20 years. Um, right now, we're under our second compact. Which, um, mm -hmm. And right now, the Marshall Islands and the U.S. are renegotiating for a third compact. The Marshall Islands government uh, stated last year that if there is no nuclear legacy discussions in these compact negotiations, uh, there is no compact three. Has the United States ever officially admitted the nuclear legacy in Marshall Islands? 
No, the United States has yet to officially apologize um, mm -hmm. for the atrocities that they committed in the Marshall Islands. So it is, it is important that the U.S. recognizes and officially apologize for what they did to the Marshall Islands. Uh, but of course, you know, if you're going to apologize, we also expect actions. Uh, you live in the United States, so you do benefit from some perks that the United States give to much of these people. Is it, um, how, how do you manage to, you know, to, to still have the strong position towards the atrocities that the United States committed? But despite, despite the fact that we do have access to some programs, um, you know, folks like me, I'm still going to call out the United States, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially because these issues are still ongoing. Uh, despite the fact that the testing program ended six decades ago, again, we are still dealing with these problems. Do people from Marshall Islands receive proper medical aid? Well, back in uh, 1996, um, so right after the Compact of Free Association was signed in 86, Marshallese were eligible for the Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. um, however, 10 years later in 1996, under the uh, Clinton administration, uh, Congress made some changes to the Medicaid program and they kicked the Marshallese off of that program. And, and so it took the, the United States uh, about 25 years to restore Medicaid for the Marshallese. And the reason why they restored Medicaid was because of the pandemic. Uh, take for instance here in Northwest Arkansas where I live, um, Marshallese account for 3% of the population here. But uh, the beginning of the pandemic around May, 50% um, of the deaths here in the region were Marshallese. And then in July of 2020, um, Marshallese accounted for 10% of the debts in the whole state of Arkansas. And people were wondering, you know, why is it that the pandemic was impacting us um, greatly? Um, and it has to do with all of these health issues that we've inherited from the nuclear testing program. You know, people, again, dealing with cancer, dealing with diabetes, um, and numerous other nuclear-related uh, diseases. Those who live in the Marshall Islands right now, not in the United States, uh, do they have any access to the cancer treatment? Well, believe it or not, the Marshall Islands has no cancer doctor. We do not have any oncologists anywhere in the Marshall Islands. And yet we have the highest rates of cancers. We have one of the highest rates of cancers in the world. Mm -hmm. And so people have to then either go out of the country, either to the Philippines or come here to the United States for these uh, medical issues. But people don't have the financial means to, to come here or to go to the Philippines or other places to seek uh, health, health care. We pretty much depend on money that comes from the United States in order to um, run the hospitals or clinics, uh, the health system, basically. It's cool that we almost have similar cups. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Benedict, you know, for the coffee break, I've been thinking about the question and what I'm personally curious about is how did you learn about nuclear legacy? Was it your family who taught you? Was it at school? How did you learn about it? And how did you get involved in the first place to become that, you know, the voice of Marshallese youth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this knowledge I pretty much taught myself. Um, mm -hmm. but I taught myself from reading materials, from asking questions, um, uh, asking family members, you know, questions about this and that, uh, 
But, you know, I was not well versed in the nuclear legacy until I joined the Marshallese Educational Initiative. Um, you know, th that's where I began to understand more about the legacy, about the compact of free association, um, and all of these challenges that we're facing. And so really my job today is pretty much to educate young people about these things. I'm also continuing to teach myself because mm -hmm. this, this legacy is filled with lies and secrecies mm -hmm. and pretty much you have to continuously dig in to learn more. The Marshall Islands is also dealing with the issue of climate change. Of um, uh, being one of four low-lying island countries in the world, um, we're on average two meters above sea level. And so the Marshallese government now has to look for finance from, from other countries or from other international organizations to try to figure out how how to uh how to combat the the climate crisis um on top of all of these other issues that they're dealing with you know speaking of climate crisis uh i think it will be interesting if you tell the audience about the Rooney dome because it it also the the product of the nuclear legacy however it has issues because of climate change as well so can you talk about it a little bit more we can't just talk about the nuclear legacy without talking about climate change um, because mm -hmm. the two issues are interlinked. Um, the Runa Dome, which is located on Anueda Atoll, one of the two areas that were used for nuclear testing, um, was built in the late 70s by 8,000 U.S. servicemen and non-servicemen um, <clears throat> to basically store nuclear waste uh, and so scientists have warned the Marshallese government that if the country were, were underwater today, uh, the structure would break open, releasing 3.1 million cubic feet of uh, nuclear debris, uh, including uh, lethal amounts of plutonium. Uh, and 3.1 million is, is equivalent to about 35 Olympic-sized swimming pools. The United States uh, Congress actually instructed DOE uh, back in December of 2019 to mm -hmm. uh, conduct an assessment on the dome. And so DOE came out with a report a couple of months later stating that the Rena Dome is fine, uh, that there's nothing to worry about. Uh, and that it's not leaking nuclear contaminants into the environment. Um, so pretty much downplaying the seriousness of what the Marshallese government and people have been saying for decades. And that is that the structure is um, leaking and that it's going to be a major problem, uh, especially again with, with rising sea levels do people in Marshall Islands or government of Marshall Islands have any resources to deal with the dome themselves? No, the Marshallese government does not have that kind of uh, financial resource to, mm -hmm. you know, to deal with the Renan Dome. Um, and in fact, it, it, it's, it's not our responsibility in the first place. Um, yes, that course. responsibility falls on the United States. You know, we did not ask for the United States to come to our shores and test nuclear weapons. Um, and then the waste, the dome, those are all the responsibility of the United States. And I think it's very important also to point out that not, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong, not all information regarding nuclear testing in Marshall Islands is declassified. So there are also the dark spots that are not known to public yet. Yes, there are still numerous documents that the United States government continues to uh, withhold from uh, the Marshallese government as well as the people. Um, I had uh, the opportunity of going to DC a few years back and 
I visited the Marshall Islands Embassy in DC, mm -hmm. and they have numerous boxes of documents that the United States gave to the Marshallese government. However, so many of the documents that I saw were redacted. So there were parts that were literally like blacked out. Mm -hmm. um, so really you, you don't know what the documents are saying fully. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we have been asking the United States to release all of these uh, documents that they continue to hold from us. Um, because I think moving forward, it's important that we know the truth. You know, uh, Benny Tick, I was curious also about the, um, uh, those atolls that maybe are not that now contaminated with radiation, because you said that, for example, Bikini Atoll is still contaminated and quite dangerous to be at. But how about other atolls? Can people live there, there? And do people live there right now? There, there are um, numerous atolls and islands that people uh, are living on. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that the nuclear testing program did not affect these other places. Um, mm -hmm. Because there is this myth that the United States created that only four atolls, um, Bigani, Anewedak, uh, Wudruk, and uh, Rongolak were the only ones that were impacted. But in reality, when those documents were released in the 90s, it shows that every part of the Marshall Islands were impacted by nuclear testing. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, if, if I remember correctly, you are the part of the, or maybe even you're leading the youth organization um, within the Marshallese community. Can you talk about it more and what do you actually do with this community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, um, I'm the uh, Assistant Director and Project Specialist for Youth, Climate and Nuclear Issues at the Marshallese Educational Initiative. Um, and it's a nonprofit that's based here in Springdale. In terms of the youth, uh, my job with them has been to teach them this history, this knowledge about the nuclear testing, um, mm -hmm. but also also helping them with uh, basic things like financial aid, college applications, um, because, you know, we, we don't want to be seen just as victims and survivors of nuclear weapons testing, but we also mm -hmm. want to be seen as uh, agents of change. You know, we talked about raising awareness about nuclear legacy among Marshallese, but how about American citizens? Well, that's where I come in. Um, <laughs> Part of my job as a, a project specialist is to educate people about the nuclear testing program uh, and its impact on Marshallese environment and, and health. Uh, you know, when I'm invited to speak at uh, conferences or events, whether that's online or in person, you know, I usually have people, Americans coming up to me saying, you know, I did not know this. Um, and of course, they wouldn't know because this knowledge is not taught in the classrooms. Um, it's not in the American history books, despite the fact, again, that it's American history. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not just the American public that are not aware. It's, it's also elected officials. You know, when I had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. in 2019, um, with other Marshallese from across the country to uh, to lobby Congress to to bring back Medicaid or restore Medicaid for Marshallese citizens. You know what we found surprising was that elected officials from other states um, where Marshallese live and work. Uh, they were not aware that there is a country called the Marshall Islands. They're not aware of the Compact of Free Association, despite the fact that it is American law. Um, 
and they were not aware of the nuclear testing program. And so really it's important, again, that this knowledge be taught. Um, because when people do know your story, when people do know why you're here in the States, um, they become more understanding and mm -hmm. it pushes them to want to help. You know, prior to 1946, when they began testing nuclear weapons, Marshallese had no, nobody on their side. Nobody was on our side. Um, but fast forward 75 plus years later, we now have allies around the world simply because of us telling our story. To finish our conversation, I guess my last question would be, what can be done by international community to help Marshallese people? Well, the most important thing is education. You know, educate mm -hmm. yourself about the history um, and the challenges that we're facing. And then take what you have learned and share it with others. Um, and for those who are American citizens or who live in the U.S., you know, reach out to your elected officials. Um, and again, do the same thing. Share the knowledge, share the challenges that we're facing. So thank you, Benedict, for being with us today. And I hope more people now have learned about the nuclear legacy of Marshall Islands and United States and will, you know, spread the awareness within their communities and uh, their governments. And uh, if you would like to say something at the end, uh, I'll give you, I'm giving you the floor right now. Well, thank you, Zenia, again for the opportunity uh, to be uh, on your show. Um, you know, thank you for giving me the space to share uh, the challenges uh, as well as the history that we're obviously still dealing with today. Um, for those who want to learn more about the work that we do here at the Marshallese Educational Initiative, uh, you know, you can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, as well as on Twitter. Uh, and then of course, visit our website, uh, that's www.mei.ngo. Uh, but again, thank you. So thank you everyone for watching. And remember, fear is here. Learn about nuclear. See you next time. Thank you everyone for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye!